Kenya Evelyn. She's a breaking news reporter for The Guardian U.S., and she's been doing some pretty incredible things in terms of enlightening us on COVID-19 as well as these protests. Thank you for joining us, Kenya. Thank you for having me. All right, Kenya. So you have written a very just it's true, enlightening piece, um, talking really about COVID-19 fears and how they're intersecting with this George Floyd protest and this whole revolution and movement. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure, absolutely. Uh, you know, before people even knew that what we have later learned is that George Floyd essentially had the coronavirus himself. He was asymptomatic at the time. He was killed by a white Minneapolis police officer. And it, he was even economically impacted, which we have seen a majority of African Americans disproportionately are. He lost his job as a bouncer at a, a nearby club and restaurant after the shutdown or, or with Minnesota's stay at home order. So before we even knew, though, those details about his personal life, People seem to resonate with this particular death by police, uh, another instance of police brutality and a black man dying at the hands of white law enforcement. This just resonated with people in a different way, considering that essentially um, what I think my Michael Acronel said beautifully online was that black people are dealing with three pandemics right now. We have a, a coronavirus epidemic, excuse me, a coronavirus pandemic that is disproportionately impacting black Americans, where we see a third of all cases and COVID-19 COVID-19 deaths are coming from black Americans and even the Caribbean immigrant community and New York City. And that is also resonating uh, with black Americans as we see numbers begin to tick. More than 23 states have have announced numbers have been on the rise since states have begun lifting their economic restrictions and stay at home orders. And even with among those states, 13 have, have reported having cases, the highest number of new cases at all during this pandemic. And that's disproportionately as well impacting black Americans. And then the second element of this pandemic is in the economic downturn, where hundreds of thousands of black Americans, a majority of whom are represented of those who more than half of this country that make less than $40,000 a year, lost their job in the first few months of this pandemic. And so this is this second economic downturn or this second pandemic is, is impacting black Americans disproportionately as well. And that created this environment where when you're dealing with the everyday institutional aspects of being black in America, where you are, it's particularly in Minnesota, 13 times more likely to die at the hands of police. This can represent an issue that just was essentially where people felt enough is enough. And we see these protests and demonstrations all around the country. And George Floyd became a representation of that, both in his life and in his death. Absolutely. And it's, it's interesting, kind of those points that you make in part, because I've been having conversations with people where they ask us, aren't you afraid to go out and protest because you might get COVID-19? But the reality is I might get killed by cops. My every day is one of living in distress and my future looks bleak and uncertain as a result of the systemic oppression that goes on in our society. So going out into the streets is not necessarily my concern as opposed to my daily life. And I know you talked a little bit about already in terms of Caribbean individuals being um, targeted by police or being victims of police violence and brutality. And you do also kind of focus a little bit on the Caribbean diasporas. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. One thing that gets lost in terms of the numbers of black Americans who are disproportionately dying in New York City is that many of these uh, deaths that go on underreported are of Caribbean immigrants. Those from we see places uh, with disproportionate number of cases, particularly in Jamaica, Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago, and then even uh, newly places like the Dominican Republic and Cuba. And so where this is impacting diasporas is this oftentimes these are the, the pillars of communities, those who have created staples of the diaspora, whether it be restaurants or whether it be media organizations, oftentimes these are the cornerstones of communities that have essentially become a dominant force in New York City. And we see that that is not, so they're not exempt from a pandemic that is disproportionately impacting black Americans uh, overall in this country. And that means they're also not exempt. We're seeing that they're also not exempt from the institutional issues that people even say is also a pandemic. Institutional racism is a pandemic in the United States. It's a public health issue that many doctors and health professionals are even recognizing. And Caribbean Americans aren't exempt from that. We've seen some instances where uh, recent cases of those who were killed by at the hands of law enforcement, particularly white law enforcement or even white vigilantes, have been Caribbean immigrants, those from Antigua, from Haiti, as well as Jamaica.
And it definitely speaks to the vulnerability of that population. But kind of switching um, to a kind of a somewhat of a related topic, you know, we've seen with these changes in this uprising how the media has been handling it. Like uh, a number of people, fortunately, are moving away from the term African-American as it is exclusive as opposed to being inclusive and recognizing that not all people of color or black people are African origins or African American, whether they may be Caribbean. Can you talk a little bit more about the changes you've recognized as a member of the media since we've had this uprising? Absolutely. I think it's even just uh, in learning that, you know, six years ago, we were talking about Mike Brown um, and his body being on the on the pavement of Ferguson, Missouri for four hours. And before we could even see his body be taken away, we were digging into his background as a person uh, to essentially what happens often disproportionately with black people in this country and in our media is that we dig into their backgrounds to in a way justify what their their fate, how they died. And in doing so, I think there were many mistakes made and many lessons learned for those of us in the media. One, and that we don't always take the, the police reports at, at first hand or, or at their word. And we are a little bit more scrutinous now, as we've seen, where even, you know, um, a 75-year-old man could have tripped and fa fallen, but we actually see within a video that he was pushed by police officers and bleeding from his head. Um, so, you know, I think there's just mistakes made, or we're learning from mistakes made, those of us in the media, and how to delicately represent the, the diversity of uh, being black and America, how that can represent different communities of black people in America, and how that can disproportionately reflect your experience here, whether you are an immigrant worker who makes up 40, or excuse me, 75% of the meatpacking industry, uh, those who particularly may be from Somalia or Ethiopia, in Minnesota, in places like Iowa and Kansas, or those from the Caribbean, as we see in New York City, or even those from Nigeria and uh, Ghana and, and places like Texas and Atlanta. So, you know, these are, this, these are different uh, communities of black Americans who may not necessarily be descended from those of the enslaved who became who were you know enslaved in what became the United States but they are instrumental parts of US history and uh, current experiences of disproportionately frontline workers and those who are also impacted by the institution of slavery and racism in this country all right and speaking of US history and also the legacy of slavery a lot of people tend to think that slavery has origins in the United States, that we created it, but what's the real? The real is actually what we know to be plantation slavery has its origins in Barbados. The slave codes written in Barbados uh, became what we know to be the basis of plantation slavery and they're pretty detailed. I actually had some years ago the opportunity to visit the Barbados Historical Society where you can see some of the original manifest of ships that uh, sailed between Barbados and the Carolinas. Um, what became, you know, North and South Carolina was actually an original colony, a colony of a colony, a subcolony of Barbados, and the seven original governors, white governors of, Bar of, of the Carolinas were white Barbadians. And so that uh, tradition, that staple of institutional slavery that, that was plantation-based originated in what we know to be Bridgetown and St. Lucie Barbados and made its way to coastal Carolinas and then uh, um, we saw cultivated in the rice plantations and then well as you know travels south throughout the united states and became cotton plantations but it has its origins from the caribbean and then also its origins from those that were captured in west africa so no that does slavery uh did slavery invent was it invented or created in the united states no was it unique in being the foundation of the u.s of u.s wealth absolutely um but no chattel slavery and plantation-based slavery has is specifically from the united states is explicitly derived from the slave codes of barbados Ah, you are a historian among them. And we only have about a few minutes left, but there's a question that I've been dying to ask you because essentially you're on the front lines of things and you have your finger on the pulse, you know what's going on. And, you know, we've seen a lot less coverage in terms of the protests and the uprising. Where do you think things will go in terms of media coverage, given that we know these things are still going on? Absolutely. I think what we're seeing right now is that there doesn't seem to be or doesn't appear to be a direct correlation between protests and demonstrations and what is coincidentally, at least initially, a rise in cases as states reopen across the country, a rise in cases of the coronavirus. And so being that, uh, even Dr. Fossey came out and said that there are ways that you can safely protest, that you can safely demonstrate, acknowledging that this is an important issue. And especially as uh, we are approaching a holiday that recognizes 
recognizes the independence loosely of African Americans and the institution of slavery in the United States, that being Juneteenth. I think we're going to see an initial momentum, um, you know, a, another a shift in momentum where there's a surge in protests and demonstrations and calls for uh, formative change beyond, you know, executive orders that address policing reform, but address some of the institutional inequities that, it, that exist um, beyond policing that disproportionately impact communities of color, whether it be housing, um, whether it be retirement funds, you know, whether it be disproportionate uh, pay inequities that we see. Um, you know, I think especially among Democrats, I think it will be interesting to see how this motivates a progressive movement among young, more liberal uh, Democrats and young progressive Americans who we see may not be turning out for primaries, may not be turning out uh, previously in the 2016 election, but are disproportionately represented at these demonstrations and protests. All right. Thank you so much. That's Kenya Evelyn. And where can they find you, Kenya? Uh, at Live from Kenya, all online. Everywhere. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us on The Conversation. Once again, I am Adrian Lawrence, and you can catch us here on the regular. On the go? Don't worry, we got you covered. You can still listen to TYT at our new podcast network. Find us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or at tyt.com slash podcast.